All right, welcome back. In this set of videos, we're going to start to look at how portfolios are actually managed. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the methods that portfolio managers use when adjusting portfolio weights. And then we'll have three follow on videos where in one, I'll review the statistical con concepts that you'll definitely need in portfolio management. And then uh, two follow on videos talking about one of the most important theories in all of investments, modern portfolio theory. So let's get started. How do we manage portfolios? Well, start to give you a sense of where I'm going to start. I'm going to first talk about why we diversify our portfolios, and then I'll give you an intro to managed funds and talk about the differences between uh, managed funds and the, the portfolios in different managed funds. And then finally, I'll talk about the most popular methods used by funds to manage their portfolios. Okay, so why do we diversify our portfolios? So let's say we have a scenario. NVIDIA has consistently outperformed the S&P 500 index almost every year. And you're, you have a client and they come to you and say, shouldn't I just put all my money in NVIDIA? Well, quite frankly, no. Uh, the reason for this is that this one stock, NVIDIA, would have a huge amount of firm-specific risk. It's not just if there's a market turnaround, N NVIDIA shares will fall uh, in price. Uh, but let's say there's a, a trade war, or let's say there's some issue in one of their production facilities. Uh, both of those are going to have detrimental effects on NVIDIA's stock price. By diversifying your portfolio into many different securities, not just NVIDIA, but oh, Ford, GM, Berkshire Hathaway, a lot of publicly traded companies in different industries, now you've reduced that firm-specific risk, or at least spread it out over different com companies. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is even though one security might outperform the market, that security is going to have very big downside risk. It's going to have a lot of supply chain risk. It's going to have a lot of uh, detrimental effects if management turns over, uh, if one of their products becomes becomes obsolete or a competitor comes up with a better uh, product. So how should portfolio managers manage their portfolios? Well, it kind of depends on what kind of fund they're running. Let's start off with mutual funds. And I guess this would also include other funds containing publicly traded assets like uh, ETFs or uh, say pension funds. So mutual funds will typically hold between about 25 and a thousand different securities in their portfolio. Uh, they're not holding just a few securities. And the reason for this is because when you diversify your portfolio across at least 25 securities that have really low correlations with one another, uh, the impact of a significant loss in one of those securities is going to be pretty minor. Uh, what you're going to see in the next couple of weeks in this class is that one of the most important things that you can do in portfolio management is to diversify your portfolio. Uh, so that's mutual funds and other funds that manage publicly traded assets. On the other hand, there's a set of assets or funds out there like private equity, hedge funds, uh, they are typically going to hold fewer assets in their portfolio. Uh, generally, that number is, oh, between, between 10 and 20 assets. Some funds will hold fewer assets. Some might hold a few more. Uh, but the reason that these funds will hold relatively fewer assets is because they're very active investors. In other words, not only are they just buying shares in those particular assets or buying bonds or essentially, you know, having an ownership stake in that those organizations or owning those assets, uh, they're also likely sitting on the board of the firm whose equity they own. So they might actually be providing some advisory expertise or they may even be part of the management. Now, there are a huge number of actively managed funds out there. Uh, so I'm going to set aside private equity funds, hedge funds for the moment, and we're just going to take a look at uh, just these are all uh, actively managed funds, mutual funds primarily. So here we have just a, a listing of these funds. And you have a huge diversity in the managed fund space. Uh, even just within mutual funds. So some of these are quite old, 2004, 86, 
Uh, some of them are quite new, 2022 inception date. Uh, some are small, some are quite large. I mean, $4 billion, $1.3 billion, and then you know you get down to like, oh, 7.93 million. Some have very high turnover in terms of the assets in their portfolio, 75%, 226%, and then some have very low turnover. Only 8% of their shares turned over this year or in this the year that they're analyzing this. And then you might have different minimum, minimum investment uh, amounts. So for some of these, it's zero. For others, maybe they don't want small-time investors investing in the fund. So they, they have significant uh, inv minimum investments. Uh, and then also there's going to be a diversity in the fees that these funds charge to investors. So your net fee, so total fee that you would pay to the manager or to the fund every single year for being invested in this fund, 3.59% of assets under management. That's quite high. Uh, a lot of funds now are trending toward about 1% or even less if they're actively managed. We'll see that in a second. Okay, so how do these funds uh, actually invest? Well, for a lot of funds that manage public equity, typically what they'll do is they'll diversify their portfolio across a bunch of different assets. Uh, so here's our, on the right here, we see a breakdown of the average investment of mutual funds in this particular category. So of the mutual funds that are similar to this fund that we're looking at, uh, they typically have 2.76% of their portfolio in basic materials, in the basic materials sector. There's 11 different sectors in an economy. Uh, this fund, they decided apparently that basic materials was overvalued likely as an asset. So they have a 0% weight in the basic materials uh, sector and they've overweighted financial services relative to their benchmark category. So this is typical typical of what we might see with a managed fund. Uh, they could hold a weight that's very similar to their benchmark category or the benchmark index, or if they think some asset class or some uh, industry is overvalued or undervalued, they'll weight their portfolio accordingly. Now, if you're wondering how big the managed fund industry is you know, around the world, this is the most accurate information I could find or the, the broadest information I could find. I mean, what you're looking at here in 2022, uh, essentially we have about $60 trillion in uh, managed assets in 2022. And about eight, you know, 15% of that is in the money market. 19% uh, of this in bonds, uh, some is in mix. So bond equity funds. And then a lot of this is going to be in uh, just equity funds. Now, what techniques do portfolio managers use when assigning portfolio weights? There's a lot of them, but let's start off with the, the most basic methods. So you have simple valuation methods, like the kind that we're going to use in our class. So you have methods like the top-down approach, which we'll use in about two weeks, where we identify a good economy and then good industries in that economy and then individual securities that are uh, undervalued in that economy and will invest accordingly. Uh, there's also what we call the bottom up approach where we just identify all of the undervalued assets and hold a portfolio of them. And then you have all kinds of blended strategies. There's all kinds of strategies here that, uh, different fund managers might advocate, but you know, top down basically means you start big, uh, at the macro level, find good economies, good industries, and then pick the stocks. Bottom up basically just means that you find undervalued assets wherever you can find them and invest in them. We also have a method called indexing. And when we talk about indexing, what we're really talking about is a portfolio, a portfolio manager uh, taking a look at a market index or some other index out there and holding the exact weights or weights in different securities or industries that are very, very similar to what's in the market index. Uh, indexing is typically associated with passive investing and typically passive management or passive investing uh, comes with lower expense ratios for investors. So this could be a good thing, uh, but you know, if your fund manager is saying that they're an active manager uh, and they're actually indexing, that means that you as an investor in that fund are probably paying way too much. 
Okay, next we have factor-based investing. And we'll do some with this uh, in this class, but you're going to see a lot more factor-based investing in portfolio management, uh, finance 410. Uh, basically, when we talk about factor-based investing, what we're really talking about is we find different variables or different, uh, we just call them factors that essentially pr uh, predict future stock returns. So if you've ever heard of, say, the, the value factor or the size factor or the momentum factor, these are some of the most common factors. And what we know from, oh, 60 years of investment research is that some of these factors predict high future returns. So for example, value stocks have historically outperformed growth stocks over the last 60 years. Uh, small stocks have historically outperformed large stocks. So what we do is we find a portfolio that has very high loadings on some of these factors, like the size factor or the value factor. And historically, those portfolios have outperformed, but there's, there's a lot to be said more than what I'm saying right now. And then we also have some statistical approaches, the most famous of which is what we're going to talk about this week with modern portfolio theory. Uh, sometimes this is called mean variance optimization or MVO. Really, all we're doing here is we're taking means, standard deviations, and correlations of assets, and we're letting the computer decide the appropriate weights. Uh, we'll do this in class, but I should say that uh, this is kind of like uh, an archaic thing. If you have a automated portfolio manager or some kind of fintech software that selects securities for your for you to invest with respect to your portfolio they're probably using modern portfolio theory or mean variance optimization okay so i thought it'd be a good idea to just kind of walk you guys through uh you know the the history of portfolio management and i have to say the history of portfolio management there's really two time periods that we think of before 1952 and really 1952 onward. Uh, in 1952, Harry Markowitz wrote uh, an academic paper on modern portfolio theory. Uh, I would argue that this is kind of seen as the, the foundation of modern investments. Of course, people invested before this, but the theories were, oh, there, there were, fewer the theories out there. I mean, as far as academic finance goes or academic investments goes, 1952 is kind of the watershed year. So we have modern portfolio theory come out in 1952, which shows us a way to optimize a portfolio based on a few statistics. And then in the 60s, the CAPM was developed. You hopefully remember CAPM from your intro finance class. Uh, this thing predicts expected returns. Uh, after the CAPM was developed, uh, capital asset pricing model, we started to see that there were some anomalous variables like uh, the value factor that predicted stock returns even when we controlled for market risk. And so over the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, what we've seen is a huge number of uh, different factors that actually predict stock returns uh, even when you, uh, you know, control for the, for the market risk of the asset. In the 80s and early 90s, we started to see some of the best-known funds uh, get started. So in 1988, the Medallion Fund, which is arguably the best-performing fund in the last 30 years, uh, was, uh, was started. And then in the early 90s, we started to see some of the more modern portfolio management techniques. So the Fama and French three-factor model was introduced. Uh, the Carhartt four-factor model was was introduced a couple of years later. Nowadays, we have five-factor models. Uh, we'll talk about these later on, but basically these are our, our factor models that we talk about. Uh, the S&P 500 ETF and some other ETFs were introduced in the early 90s. And lately, we've seen some rapid innovation with the introduction of chat GPT and large language models that can use textual analysis to predict stock returns. Okay. So with that being said, let's talk about the traditional approach to portfolio management. Uh, this approach has been used, you know, pre-1952, and it continues to be used. Basically, the traditional approach emphasizes a balanced approach or a balanced portfolio containing stocks and bonds, or maybe you just focus on stocks or bonds. It depends on what's in your, uh, you know, your funds prospectus. So, uh, 
the traditional approach, generally investments are made at the manager's discretion. So the manager will typically have some analysts that work under them. They'll identify stocks that are bonds that they believe are undervalued or overvalued, and they're going to invest in the undervalued ones. Uh, so the fund manager will usually try to be somewhat active, but they may be a passive investor holding a portfolio and not really changing the weights through time. Uh, this method typically assumes that fund managers are skilled, meaning that they have some knowledge that allows them to beat the market. Uh, what we've seen is that the fund managers that do show some skill, meaning that they consistently beat the market, these are the fund managers that can start to raise their expense ratio, the amount they charge investors to invest in the fund. And this is typically how you get wealthy or historically have gotten wealthy as a fund manager. You have a couple of good years, you have a high expense ratio, and then a lot of investors want to invest in your fund, and so you have more assets under management, and because your your compensation is based on a, a percentage of your assets under management, uh, you, you, you know, you're making a lot of money. Okay, uh, what changes are we seeing in portfolio management as we get away from the traditional approach? Well, Factor-based fund uh, methods are becoming way more common. Sometimes we call these smart beta techniques where we literally just, uh, our portfolio is exposed to a number of factors. So like the size factor, the momentum factor, meaning that basically the securities in the portfolio are uh, heavily dependent or do quite well when let's say there's uh, the momentum trade does well or the value trade does well or the size uh, trade does well. Uh, we've also seen more investment in passively managed ETFs through time. Uh, I'll be blunt, about 75% of my uh, joint brokerage account with my wife is in a, uh, it's actually two passively managed ETFs, the S&P 500 ETF and the NASDAQ QQQ. Uh, we've also seen that quant funds, they they kind of came onto the scene in the 90s and 2000s, uh, but they use very high-end techniques to predict uh, future returns, and some of them will use neural networks and AI, but uh, there's kind of less proof that neural networks and AI offer uh, positive alpha or allow investors to actually beat the market consistently. Okay, so other changes we've seen in the last several years. So what I got here is a, a chart showing the expense ratios through time. So at the top here, we see actively managed equity mutual funds. Historically, those are going to have the highest expense ratios. Uh, so what this 1.08% means is that, you know, of the assets under management or AUM, investors are paying 1.08% of those assets that the fund manager is managing every year as uh, a fee to the fund for the privilege of managing that portfolio. Uh, what you can see is definitely a decline. You know, it's gone from 1.08% to 68 basis points. And then when we get down here to, let's say, index funds, uh, these are passively managed funds. The, the expense ratios historically have always been low. They've only gotten lower. Uh, and the reason for this is that some of these Index uh, index funds are enormous. So, like the the S and P five hundred ETF, the Spider ticker symbol SPY, uh, that's large enough that, quite frankly, uh, you have economies of scale here. You you know you have traders handling the trades. You have an asset manager, but because this fund is so large, uh, the the fees can be significantly lower and still pay for all the the necessary expenses at the mutual at the the you know that come with running the ETF. Okay, so let's summarize. Diversification is key uh, to having a high return while still reducing downside risk. Remember, we want to eliminate or significantly reduce the firm-specific risk. That's why we diversify our portfolio. Uh, funds will use a variety of different investment techniques, uh, factor-based investing, traditional investing. Oh, some funds will use AI or neural networks to predict stock uh, stocks that are undervalued. Uh, there's all kinds of techniques out there. I mean, it's an entire ecosystem. Uh, we also talked about passive management, uh, ad advanced tech methods. Uh, and then finally, fees are absolutely decreasing through time. And that really is, I think, 
you know, there's there's definitely uh, a case to be made that passive management is becoming more popular, uh, and there's more competition on mutual funds, and so they're having to cut fees to remain competitive. Uh, but we'll talk about some some more explanations for that as we go along in this class. All right, so with that, I'm going to bring this lecture to an end, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.